I think no matter what characters you pick, no matter like, do you want to play Vandor, like Phantom, it's just like pure aim and then just like basic things, you know? Hello, hello everyone. It's Martin, aka Anders. You were just listening to a short clip of an interview from the G2 Esports Invitational that just happened as part of the Ignition series. It was between Frankie and Finnish pro player Taimu. We'll get to that a little bit more a little bit later. But this video overall, I've teased in varying capacities to a bunch of different people. I've been labeling it as sort of a stop playing CSGO in Valorant video, but really what it is, is a high level look at how I think strategy in Valorant overall should be approached and how I think the current pro ecosystem doesn't reflect that in a dangerous way. With that said, let's hop right into it. To kick us off, let's tackle that entire interview with Taimu from the G2 event. I've got Taimu with me now, the captain of the team that you just saw winning. And, and Taimu, I've got to ask, yeah! <laughs> Some teams have felt uncomfortable on Bind and they confessed that to me in interviews yesterday. You could not have looked more happy. Why is that a map that works so well for this new team of yours? I, I think it was just the fact that we um, we outplayed the Angel team. I think they were overthinking a lot. They were trying to do these slow pushes with utility, just explode with utility, and we just had better in individual performance. Like, we had uh, multiple rounds where we won two versus one, I mean, one versus two, one versus three, and stuff like that. So I think that just, like, kind of tipped, uh, tipped the scale onto us. Do you think overthinking might be a Counter-Strike in-game leader thing? <laughs> yes, I definitely think so, because this game, right now, I think, no matter what characters you pick, no matter, like, do you want to play Vandor, like, Phantom, it's just, like, pure aim and then just, like, basic things, you know? Refragging, all this stuff. If we go to unpackage this interview a bit and look specifically at what Taimu's saying, he's describing two major phenomena in Professional Valorant right now. One of which isn't going to surprise anybody, it's that gun skill trumps all. Your ability to have strong fundamentals like refragging and just winning 1vx gunfights where you technically shouldn't be able to, that's the main thing that drives people's success or failure in competitive right now. That shouldn't shock anybody. The second point though, and this is the one I really want to hit home because it will make a lot of the points I make throughout this video more contextualized, and that's that he says that Angel's team didn't just lose to them because they had lesser gun skill, but because they were overthinking the game. He was faulting them for trying to apply slow cerebral executes to the extent where it's not only uh, a situation where they were winning off of raw gun skill, but that the specific execute-centric, heavily strategic approach of Angel's team was bad. Before we go much further, I want to make a quick note that this isn't me railing on Taimu. This is a situation where many pros are thinking what he's saying. He's just the one who got caught saying it out loud, which is a common issue in this industry. So this is by no means saying, oh, witch hunt Taimu. I would wager that at least 70% of all Valorant pros right now have the exact same mindset he does. Now's the part where I get to stretch my legs and explain why that mindset is completely wrong. And we're going to do it by looking all over the place at tons of different things. And we're going to start, of all places, in Korea in 2014 playing League of Legends. For those of you with either League of Legends or Overwatch backgrounds, you might recognize the name Christopher Monte Cristo Michaels. Back in 2014, Monte Cristo was a caster frequently appearing on the LCK League of Legends broadcast. While not a particularly impactful moment for the majority of the community, for me, his finest moment throughout his entire casting career happened in 2014, when he got into a discussion about what peak League of Legends looked like. He described his opinion, which was controversial with the cast, that a perfect game of League of Legends involved zero kills, no inter-team interaction, but rather player versus environment, and that was all. This statement, despite being specific to League of Legends, has theoretical applications across the vast majority of esports. 
The reason this statement can be plausible is because in League of Legends, the endgame objective of destroying your opponent's nexus does not require kills in any capacity. While it may seem unreasonable, and this is certainly theoretical and not particularly practical, a perfect game of Valorant also has no kills. You either plant the spike, have flawless sight control, and have outsmarted your opponents and disincentivized them so effectively with utility that they never push onto the site and the bomb explodes with no casualties, or you play so well on defense that your stall tactics lead to your opponents running out the clock every single round. The most flawless strategic games that could be played in Valorant will never have a kill. That isn't me saying that we'll ever see those games. In fact, if I was a gambling man, we will never see one of those games, ever. But that doesn't change the reality that it's the true peak strategic level of the game. And the reason that is, is because if you can remove interaction with player opponents, you will always be in a better situation. Player opponents, by nature, are a human element with extremely high unpredictability. In order to achieve greatness in any competitive game, you want to limit and mitigate your exposure to the variability represented by your opponents. If you never run into an enemy player, you still know every single condition in your game state that is pertinent to you winning. On offense, you still know where you can plant the spike. You still know how long it will take for the spike to go off. On defense, you know how long it will take for your team to run out the clock, and you know the layout of the map. And I'm going to reiterate one more time so I don't sound crazy that this is a pipe dream. I do not expect this to happen, ever. But that doesn't change the fact that it's still the best case scenario and is the lens that we should view all strategy and Valorant around. If you know what the best case scenario is, and there isn't a significant detriment that your team receives for pursuing it, and there isn't an opportunity cost of a substantially effective alternative approach, then you should always aspire for the best case scenario. Now, with that as my baseline premise, I frame all Valorant strategy as having two primary goals. The first and primary goal is to never have to interact with opponents in the first place. The second goal is to make sure that in the event you do have to interact with opponents, you never ever do it on equal terms. Now with that second point, we're getting more into the realm of realistic situations. Where we know we're going to have to interact with opponents at some point, we now have to start looking at making sure that we always have favorable situations and that we are, to my prior point, mitigating the variability that they represent and how it affects us. To that end, we're going to come a lot closer to modern day and take a look at one of Astralis' main executes from Mirage B. In this execute, Astralis uses lineups for five different smokes to completely lock down the site. They tackle both of my two points. First, they avoid having to interact with opponents in the first place. Their five smokes dissuade retakes from both market and short, reducing the likelihood that they'll have to interact with opponents from those angles. And they hit on the second point as well, where they have smokes disrupting the lines of sight into apps, allowing low risk opportunities to Molotov out bench, van, and arches to flush out defenders, forcing advantage states and making sure that they're not fighting on equal terms. We've now taken a contextual premise from League of Legends and shown it exists at the highest level of competitive CSGO, and now we're going to take it yet another place. Before we get to that third place, I wanted to outline where I think Valorant competitive is right now, because I think pro teams exhibit three different levels of play. At the lowest level, you have the one that Taimu was talking about, where you have raw gun skill and fundamentals trumping all, where the highest level of strategic finesse is just someone winning a 1vx. Above that level, you have what I call the CSGO level, where you do see proper executes, you see plays like the 5 Smoke Astralis play, but it's rarely utilizing something that isn't basic and familiar. You don't see these executes employing things effectively that aren't just a basic smoke, or a molly, or something that's a vague equivalent to an HE grenade. But then, at the level above both of those, you have the actual Valorant level of gameplay in Valorant. These are going to be executes 
that are creatively and innovatively utilizing the pieces of utility that are specific to Valorant. Let's dive a little bit deeper by taking a look at Rainbow Six Siege. It may seem pretty troll to not look at Valorant when I start talking about the Valorant level of gameplay. And yet, if you look at Rainbow Six Siege, it plays into this whole line of thought where the premise that we are functioning under is universal across almost all esports and can be outlined by taking a look at multiple other places. The reason I think this is an apt comparison is because if you were a CSGO player who was dropped into an R6S game, you wouldn't dream for a single second that you could get away with only using smokes, frags, and mollies despite the fact they all exist in the game. There is such a deep pool of utility beyond those basic elements that it is almost forced to be used on an inherent level in Rainbow Six Siege. That line of reasoning can be directly paralleled to Valorant. The pool of utility in Valorant is vastly superior to that in CSGO in terms of breadth, and yet we don't see it utilized. And when I say we don't see it used, I obviously don't mean it's literally never used. Cypher is the second most played agent in competitive play right now, and he has tripwires and cameras which have no analog whatsoever in CSGO. What I am getting at when I say that is that we rarely, if ever, see them utilized in actual executes. When we see it used, it is very regularly just arbitrarily utilized for an advantage in a 1v1, not used in a high-level strategic sense that I would expect in a game with this level of depth. One of the main questions that I've been asking myself when I'm trying to differentiate between these different levels of play is when I see an execute, when I see a strategy go down exactly as a team expected it, I ask myself, could they have just done this in CSGO? Are they using anything unique to Valorant that actually makes this a Valorant level execute, or are they just rehashing executes from a past game out of comfort? And that's not to say that an execute that can be done in both CSGO and Valorant isn't a phenomenal execute. I'm simply saying, in a game that has a breadth of utility as wide as Valorant's, there's almost a 100% likelihood that there is something that would have been better tailored to the situation you're applying it in. Just say for example, I'm doing a bind B execute where we're primarily pushing out of long. Let's say it's Astralis style and we're just going to smoke off every single point of contact and then we're going to push site using mollies to press out. I can use brimstone smokes in hookah, in elbow, and in CT, and I have a similar setup where I framed the entire site. I can then molly out close left of garden, and we can push the site. That's great. That is a phenomenal execute that I would love to see more of at the pro level, frankly. We don't even get stuff of that caliber very frequently. And yet, if you take a look at that, what happens if I take viper instead of brimstone? I put Viper outside of Hookah with a single escort so that she doesn't get picked by an early press through Hookah. I lay Toxin Screen across the middle of the site, blocking LOSs for both Backsight, Nook, and CT. I can Snake Bite Backsight, and I can Snake Bite Elbow. I've now reduced the amount of exposure that my team has to the opponents to Elbow and people pushing through the Toxin Screen, which would have to cross an LOS of me and the second who are pushing through Hookah. Once you get onto site, you can set up a smoke orb for a one-way on elbow, and if you plant by tube for long, you now have an incredible chokehold on site that allows you to multi-man hold from long, and the site retake for your opponents is absolutely hellish. And that's with only me accounting for Viper's utility. Obviously there are holes in that, but you have four other people to shore them up. What happens if someone takes an early TP? Well, what happens if the second who's with Viper is a Cypher, and he presets a Cypher cage on TP? As soon as he hears the noise, he triggers it and they're now locked down. What happens if you have Omen and Sage as part of the trio that's pushing long? You can have Omen Paranoia out close left of Garden and also hit back sight. You can have Sage follow that up with an immediate wall of elbow, and you've then at that point minimized your exposure to opponents almost to zero. There's almost no universe where if that execute goes off, you are not taking extremely favorable trades against your opponents, and then, even after the execute has subsided, you have toggleable Viper utility all over the place ensuring that you have a long-term game plan. And that brings us all the way back around to Taimun, who would probably say that I'm overthinking things right now, and he might be right. But you want to know something else? When he got to say that Angel's team was overthinking against them, 
he was doing it with confirmation bias. And I'm willing to bet that if Angel's team had equivalent gun skill compared to Taimu's, they would have won that match. Gun skill will only get you so far, and it is going to be a necessary step in this game's evolution that every single pro team starts overthinking things. It is going to happen, because eventually you're going to end up in a situation where your raw gun skill is equal, or heaven forbid, worse than your opponent's, and they're trying to actually strategically finesse their way through their matches, and they're going to run you through because of it. And so let's sum that all up. We need to stop playing a gun skill level game. We need to stop playing CSGO in Valorant's client. The only thing that should be on every pro's and every player's mind right now is actually playing Valorant in Valorant. That might sound silly, but if you've been paying any attention, you know exactly what I mean. I'm really interested to hear your guys' thoughts on this video. Writing the script alone for this was excruciating. It is a topic that is enough of a hot-ish take that I was very concerned that it would come off as arrogant or patronizing or beating down on other esports and so the phrasing and explanation of my methodology and my thinking was incredibly important to me. I'm super interested to hear everybody's opinion. If you're a pro that happens to watch my videos, if you're a content creator who happens to watch my videos, hell, if you're an iron player who watches my videos, give me your genuine thoughts on this. The number one thing that I personally enjoy in esports is the deep, deep theory and strategic concepts that pertain to these games. This is my bread and butter and the stuff that I absolutely love. Let me know if you agree with what I'm saying, you disagree with what I'm saying, if you think that my sort of amalgamated concepts from League of Legends and R6 and CSGO being all applied to Valorant simultaneously is on or off base. I love getting this finally out in the open and I look forward to hearing your guys' thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, as usual, throw me a like and a subscribe. You can catch more of my insane thoughts and rantings on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch, all at AndersTV. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.